So I'm Jan Boxel, I'm director of the Parr Center for Ethics, and we sponsor um, lots of different events, but every month we sponsor a Lunch and Learn, where we ask um, some of our faculty fellows who are part of the Parr Center to give programs for us to sort of inform us about uh, topics and topical issues that are going on uh, around us, uh, as well as things that sometimes we don't think of. So I had asked, I had talked to Kathy Packer and Lois uh, earlier about doing one, and this was before the WikiLeaks thing came up, and so this was very, very appropriate. So today's, um, which is why we have so many, right? <laughs> um, in 2010, of course, the internet, internet site WikiLeaks became a household name after the public disclosure of private, uh, previously secret materials relating to foreign relations in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So today, uh, Two of our PAR Center fellows, Lois Boynton, who's a, an associate professor of journalism and mass communication and specializes in ethics and public relations, and uh, Dr. Kathy Packer, who's a professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication as well, uh, who specializes in media law. Please welcome Kathy and Lois, and we'll end. Thank you. My We're probably going to sit unless you tell us otherwise. Um, uh, we're not much taller after we stand up. Anyway. <laughs> Speak for uh, yourself. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, we've got basically three parts we wanted to go over uh, quickly and then open for any questions. Um, first piece having what exactly are we talking about here with regard to WikiLeaks. Uh, then cover the aspects. Kathy's going to talk about what are some of the legal ramifications that are going on. And then I'm going to um, try to help wrangle in some aspects of the ethical implications of what uh, is involved with WikiLeaks. So this is just a screen grab of uh, a couple of days ago of what we were able to get as far as uh, the home page for WikiLeaks. If you, if you go to WikiLeaks uh, as a page, you may not be able to find it, but you can find a mirror image of it and access it that way. So we were uh, able to grab just a bit of the screen uh, it tells you a little bit about um, what their intent is uh, as far as an organization is concerned. Just a, a few quick facts here, and I apologize, I'm looking over my shoulder. Um, it, even though it's just becoming a household name, uh, they're marking their fifth anniversary uh, as uh, founding in uh, around 06. Uh, they uh, claim that within the first year they already had a million documents, so what they have now is probably quite phenomenal in the five years since then. This name has become very familiar, Julian Assange, uh, who is the de facto director. Uh, this is uh, a collection of people who uh, put themselves more in a dissident type of a category, and, and he is part of the, the leadership arm. It used to be wikified. It used to be editable, uh, hence the WikiLeaks name. Uh, no longer that kind of access uh, involved in it, and it has shifted over from there. Uh, and it, it has had some positive recognition. The Economist gave it an award in 08. Uh, so there, there has been uh, some positives and negatives going on uh, around this organization. This is among some of the um, links that you can go to uh, as far as what's on uh, the WikiLeaks page. You'll notice one thing I think is of interest is this is an international depository. Uh, this is not just going after um, uh, the government secrecy in the United States, but in uh, with regard to other governments as well, uh, hence some of the uh, language challenges that I have. And this is just a page I was able to pull that is uh, the lead-in to uh, accessing Iraq war logs uh, from the past few years. Uh, and just something from a news perspective that uh, emerged yesterday is uh, the New York Times is thinking of doing a similar thing, uh, having a uh, sort of a pass lane for leakers and having uh, its own uh, depository of, of information as well. So it's raising some interesting questions uh, with regard to uh, this as a new trend, I guess, for lack of a better word. 
So um, at this point, I think, yes, I will turn it over to uh, Kathy uh, after Woody figures out how to get her PowerPoints up. And so we will pause for station identification, I guess. Okay. Did I see at the bottom it said Gmail account? We couldn't read it right at the bottom with the last one. Uh, you might remember it was on there. Yeah, Gmail account, um, IT numbers were, were going to be, be sent to, to some journalists. It was Gmail. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're on. Thanks. Um, legal scholars um, have been having a lot of fun uh, with this case. And there's a, I've been reading um, their debate about, about the question that people always ask me, which is, well, can they do this? That's always, that's a student, my, the question my students always have when something outrageous is published or something that they think is outrageous, it's like, can they do this? Um, and so legal scholars have been talking about this. And I think um, one thing here, the point that I'd like to make is that this is not just a legal problem. This is a, a practical problem that has to do with how you secure <coughs> information in the digital age when it's um, so easy to copy and to transfer it. So that's one of the problems. And there certainly are political problems here, um, problems with uh, the executive branch not being able to secure classified information and, and be undoubtedly being embarrassed by that. Um, so there's a lot of different things that go on together in the, but what I wanted to talk about briefly, is just, you know, what does the First Amendment probably say about this? Not that we really know, but, you know, what does it probably say? And then uh, when we get into the discussions, we can talk about some of these other practical and political issues as well, because it, it may end up being more of a political problem or a practical problem than, than a legal problem. Okay. So uh, what you hear most about is the Espionage Act. And, you know, we, the Espionage Act has been around a long time, and we've been happy that, he, that the government hasn't used it, because when it does, it's always sort of it ends up in being an embarrassment to our country, I think. Um, in World War I, there were, uh, and I'll just point out, I just wanted you to be able to see this in case you wonder what something like the Espionage Act looks like. Um, here, this section, which is when they talk about punishes unauthorized <coughs> possession, which would clearly be WikiLeaks, has unauthorized possession of information relating to national defense. Um, and they have reason to believe it could be used to the injury of the United States or the advantage of a foreign nation. Um, whether WikiLeaks has reason to believe that or should have reason, I don't know. Uh, but obviously this could cover anybody who has received uh, classified, uh, you know, secure, national security information. Um, it could be applied to them. And, and that's what people are talking about. And there was, um, in World War I, uh, you know, in our, <coughs> one of our worst periods in, term of, in terms of First Amendment freedoms, um, 900 people were imprisoned under the Espionage Act. And these were anti-war activists. Um, I was an anti-war activist, not in World War I. Um, and believe me, we had a lot more freedom during the Vietnam War than we had, um, than they had at this point. Um, so, in Shank v. United States in 1919, the Supreme Court said that these prosecutions, a, one of the prosecutions under the Espionage Act, did not act, did not violate the First Amendment, that the government you know, had the right to punish people for um, the activities um, described in the Espionage Act. Um, and this is the case, if, if you might have heard the term clear and present danger, this is where the clear and present danger <coughs> test comes from. And it sets this limit on free expression in America. Uh, you know, we've never had absolute protection. The question is, where is the line? And the line, according to this, was that you couldn't communicate um, anything that created a clear and present danger that it would bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to, to prevent. And in this, in this case, um, Schenck was accused of, he was the general secretary of the Socialist Party of America. He believed the war was caused by and would benefit the rich and that the poor people would actually do the fighting and the dying. We still have that critique. I know. People say that now. Michael Moore says that, and you know, he doesn't go to jail. Um, Schenck participated in a variety of anti war activities and mailed 15,000 leaflets to draftees and soldiers, urging them to resist the draft. And he was arrested for attempting to cause 
insubordination in the military and disturbing the draft. Uh, I, I don't think that would be a crime today. Uh, the court, but the court in this case was trying to nothing to uphold his conviction. And, but a thing to realize is this is the first major First Amendment case to ever be heard, decided by the Supreme Court. First Amendment law doesn't start being developed until the 20th century. Before that, we have the First Amendment, but we don't have cases. And so this is sort of their first stab at it. And since then, we have a few other, uh, piece, we have a few other pieces of law that might be applicable here. So what we know from this is that in 1919, in a time of war, the courts thought that the government had a right to prosecute Schenck for his expression. Um, in a later case, in a much later case, the Supreme Court seems to indicate that the clear and present danger test also must require imminent lawless action, that this would result in imminent lawless action. So that's sort of the present part, like how immediate does the danger have to be? Well, maybe it has to be really immediate, clear and present danger, maybe clear and imminent danger um, to the nation. And so they sort of ramp this up a little bit, make it a little bit harder for the government to prove. Uh, this was not a national security case. This had to do with uh, race relations. Um, more to the point, maybe, is Bartnicki in 2001, in this case involved a radio broadcaster. Somebody gave the radio broadcaster an illegally taped telephone conversation, which the you know, so some other person, not the journalist, but some other person that taped this and given it to the, to the radio reporter and he put it on the air. And the question was whether he had a First Amendment right to do that. And the answer in the court was very clear, absolutely. Um, I have a friend who's a media law attorney in Raleigh who represents and he's an observer in WRAL and lots of reporters that you, know, you see in the, in the news locally. And as she always says, what she tells reporters is, if you didn't steal it, you can publish it. You know, that that's the rule. Um, you know, so, and I tell my students that. Don't be stealing stuff, you know? <laughs> I, cannot, I can't get you off the hook when you do that. But if someone wants to steal it and give it to you, that's okay. Again, not, not a national security case, again, but um, a pretty clear and strong ruling from the Supreme Court um, that this would be okay. Now, for years, when I teach the Pentagon Papers case, I told my students, wouldn't Daniel Ellsberg have loved the internet? Because when Daniel Ellsberg stole the Pentagon Papers and went to distribute them to newspapers around the country, he was driving around the country hiding from the federal agents who were after him and doing these like, um, sort of like spy drops where he, you know, call somebody, some reporter and say, okay, meet me at 10 at this phone booth and, you know, be like all this I spy stuff. And if he'd done the same thing today, he just would have put them all on the internet. It would all be out, and nobody would be chasing him, and it would all be fine. Um, so this is interesting, because it is factually similar to WikiLeaks, the, the stealing of, of classified documents, and then they're being published by um, newspapers. He was charged under the Espionage Act as the person who stole them and, and distributed them. Um, the charges against him were dropped. Uh, some of you remember this after um, some of the plumbers, they called them the plumbers from the Nixon administration, broke into his psychiatrist office to steal his psychiatric file to use as part of the government's case against him in his criminal prosecution. When the judge found out, the judge dismissed all the charges against him. So, not a good. I just say there's a great movie about, a documentary about Dan, Daniel Ellsberg, and it's called The Ellsberg. Didn't think you know everything that happened with the Pentagon papers, but it was just. And like I forget the name of it. It was the, the most dangerous, dangerous man in America. Uh, well, he came out last year nominated for an <coughs> The most dangerous man in America. Wow. And it's shown around here a lot, but you can get it. It's coming into Netflix at the end of February. Yeah. 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 I got it in my queue. You know, it's like I yeah. signed up for it, but it didn't yeah, come around. Yeah, but everybody should watch it. It's just. <laughs> Now, in this case, the newspapers that actually published the documents, and there were a number of them, were never prosecuted. And 
in this case, and there are some other cases too, a thing that's interesting is the newspapers in these cases, through our history, have never <coughs> been prosecuted for this. You know, they've never been prosecuted. But there often are footnotes in these cases in which some justices say, well, you know, it's possible that the government could prosecute the newspapers that publish these. So they always say, that's always kind of hung out there, like maybe that's okay. And the way that we have traditionally thought about the espionage case, people like me who teach media law to students and talk about media law, is that, that the, the Espionage Act, which talks about communicating this information, was primarily about um, spies. It was communicated in the sense that I would take all the documents I stole, I'd put it in a briefcase, I'd go to Vienna, and then I'd give it to you on a street corner. It was that kind of communicating, and it was never um, held by the government to include the publication in the Washington Post, the New York Times, or anyone else, anywhere else. Now, this was a prior restraint case, and those, that's just for those of you who know about the law and know that that might, that makes some difference, but there's some wording in the case that is, <coughs> seems to apply to WikiLeaks. Now, the Pentagon, in the Pentagon Papers case, there are nine separate opinions. Each justice wrote a separate opinion. So trying to figure out what the court thinks is a sort of an arithmetic thing where you have to kind of add up how many people say the same thing. So it's a little unclear about what the court thinks, but Justice Douglas actually talks about guarding dip military and diplomatic secrets, which is very much at the heart of the WikiLeaks case, and finds that guarding those at the expense of informed representative <coughs> government provides no real security for our republic. So in his view, you know, that's... <coughs> He's clearly allowing publication here. And um, Justice Stewart talking about this disclosure, um, talking about how immediate the danger has to be in order to be able to stop publication. Now, stopping publication with WikiLeaks wasn't an issue because there wasn't a way to stop it in the beginning. I mean, because it just, it happened, the government didn't know about it. Um, but I'm sure they, they would like to do that. Um, there's a lot of facts that we don't know about the WikiLeaks case um, that make a difference in all of this. Um, one of them is, you know, how harmful, you know, what is the damage that can be caused by these disclosures? Um, that we don't know. Um, I do read people saying, well, nothing bad has happened. Um, obviously, there's no grave harm to our nation. And, but you know, then you can read other reports that sort of argue the other way. But I don't think there's been any documented harm that came from this. Um, nor was there any har documented harm that I know of that ever came from the Pentagon Papers. Um, years after this, the Solicitor General, who argued the government's case in front of the Supreme Court, wrote an op-ed piece that ran in the News and Observer and many other places that said basically he knew all along that, that you know, there weren't any national security problems, he just had to argue the case. So the government had inflated the, uh, the severity of the harm that might be done. And you know, whether they're doing that in the WikiLeaks case, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, whether they're trying, the government is trying to demonize Julian Assange, he's sort of helping them do that, I think, but sort of demonizing him the way they demonized Daniel Ellsberg, and, you know, labeling him the most dangerous man in America. Um, you know, that could be. Um, one of the issues in the um, Espionage Act is the issue of intent. You know, was it Assange's intent to you know, harm the United States? Uh, he wrote essays in 2006 in which he says he, want, he advocates bringing down corrupt governments, including the United States, and he opposes secrecy-based government. They call him a radical transparency. He has a philosophy of radical transparency, which all journalists should have, I think. But um, whether the government could tie general statements like that to his you know, release of these classified documents. You know, that's really that's really hard to know exactly what would happen. Um, yeah. 
The also the the court said very clearly in the Pentagon Papers that the responsibility for keeping national security security secrets lies with the executive branch of the government. It's not the responsibility of the press to keep government secret. It's not their legal responsibility. Whether it's their ethical responsibility is a separate question. But it's not our legal responsibility, and it's not the le certainly not the legal responsibility of WikiLeaks. So, you know, it, it lies with the gover government uh, to have to worry about that. And um, some other questions. Does he even have First Amendment rights? Well, first of all, he'd have to be extradited. We'd have to get him here in order to prosecute him. And we have extradition treaties with various countries that might send him over. But they don't have to send him if he's being brought over here to be prosecuted for a political crime. People pro think that's pro this is probably a political crime. So maybe he couldn't be extradited. If he did come over, then he has First Amendment rights. Um, the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law. It speaks to what the government can do. So it doesn't really matter who they're doing it to. You know, they got him over here. He has First Amendment rights. Um, and people seem to be pretty much in agreement. Scholars seem to be pretty much in agreement with that. Um, and I think, you know, my conclusion is here based on, you know, Pentagon Papers and Bartnicki v. Bopper, um, that the old uh, Schenck case is um, would not be the deciding case in here, and I think that he probably uh, would win a First Amendment challenge. Um, the only thing I worry about is our <coughs> Supreme Court. And so if I'm on the Supreme Court, you know, he would win. Whether What this court would do, you know, whether this current Supreme Court would, would stand up to the executive <coughs> branch and say, we don't care what you say about national security, we don't think this is a problem, we're going to let him go, um, that I don't know. Um, it's not. It's it's a very different day in the court than it was when the Pentagon Papers came around, and the court was very willing to stand up to the executive branch and say no. Um, in that case, they basically concluded that the government was embarrassed by what had been revealed in the Pentagon Papers. What had been revealed was that the government had been lying to the American people for years about what it was doing in Vietnam, and that they wanted to cover that up. So they didn't believe there was any serious um, national security problem there, so they let them publish. Yeah. Um, they talk about prosecuting him under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. He would have had to be some part of actually taking those records, um, maybe being involved in a conspiracy with the soldier who was being prosecuted under military law for having leaked the documents. So, and that's a f another factual question. We don't know what happened. We don't know whether he somehow guided this, made this happen, participated in a conspiracy, whether Assange did that, or did he simply be, you know, the visible Wik WikiLeaks and the man just gives him the documents? That's another question. You know, that's a different question. And uh, lots more. You know, and we can come back to these. I just wanted to show you some of these. Um, you know, these are the practical questions, the political questions. Um, you know, and and uh, <clears throat> so, in summary, I think prosecuting uh, Julian Assange under the Espionage Act would clearly be a violation of the First Amendment. And whether he's guilty of some criminal conspiracy that we don't have any way of knowing about that. Yeah. Somebody had a question. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I have a question about the computer fraud part. You know, oh, you part. would, because that's the part I don't really know about. About whether yeah. he actively, you know, yeah. um, helps somebody steal the documents. And you know, when you're a journalist, if you, you know, leave your office open and a document appears in your office, you know, if you haven't done anything wrong. Use the document. Right? <laughs> What he's done is he's put something online that makes it very easy for people to jump. But to me, is that no different than just leaving your office open and available to anybody who wants to drop by? I mean, the government seems to be implying that there's something sinister about that, that he's making it easy for people to dump electronically. Yeah. But is that the same thing as actively conspiring to steal? I don't think so. 
I hope it's not. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I hope it's not. I mean, yeah. as Lois said, the New York Times is contemplating developing the same kind of site of their yeah. own for it's people to dump stuff. Um, you know, leakers worldwide. People have done this. I mean, publications in the United States have published, you know, classified documents, secret documents, for years and years and years. It's gone on. I and think you receive them in your email. I mean, you receive them in your email. So he's just making it slightly easier because the documents are so big. Yeah. And the real problem might not be that how easy it is to upload them to WikiLeaks, but how easy it is to copy them and get them out of the Pentagon's or wherever they're, wherever they're working, because the guy went in the Pentagon, but how easy it is today to copy so many documents. But so if you gave them some software that made it easy for them to do that, that might be that different. That might be different, yeah. I feel like you would have had to have an active role in actually obtaining the, the documents for that to even apply. And I think if, you know, he had a, uh, Assange had a conversation with um, this man who said, you know, I have some documents I want to give you, or I'm thinking about giving them to you, are you interested in them? And he said, yes, I don't think that's a conspiracy, any more than receiving any kinds of information like this. But you have to, I think, actually help him. You mentioned the way that newspapers haven't been prosecuted in the past. My understanding of what happened here, and I really apologize because that was late in the first five minutes, but the newspapers and other media organizations worked with the government to um, redact a significant <coughs> portion of the documents, and the ones they made publicly available online was really just a small portion of them? Well, my understanding is that when they approached the government and asked that the government would like to weigh in on what needed to be redacted, that the government said no. And so the papers in WikiLeaks have been doing it on their own, redacting large portions of it. And the last thing I read was that only 1% of this latest batch of documents has actually been released. Mm -hmm. And they're being redacted, which just means they cross parts out. Um, in an attempt by the newspapers, the four newspapers that had them in the leagues to protect national security, which is an ethical issue. My point is they don't I don't think they have to do that. But you know the question would be do they have some ethical obligation to do that? Was there so back to Brandberg View Ohio, was there any talk about so essentially they were encouraging people to who had been drafted to resist. So is that not technically encouraging people to commit a crime? Because you know, violating the Select Service Act, or I mean, how does that? How well, does that you're free to advocate that. I, was, I'm just I, could, I mean, I, could, I have the First Amendment right to stand up here and tell you all to drive 90 miles an hour on the way <laughs> home from work tonight. Mm -hmm. And I have that First Amendment right, or I can tell you, you know, if you were drafted not to report for the draft. You know, in later wars, that goes on all the time, yeah. and people weren't prosecuted for that. Um, but you know, World War One was a time when you know, our First Amendment rights were not as well developed yet. People weren't as aware of their rights because it wasn't part of the public conversation like it is now. And now, if you told anybody what they couldn't say, right away they'd say, well, wait a minute, I have the First Amendment. You know, now it's part of our culture now, and that's important. Well, what comparisons would you draw between the Valerie Plain <coughs> <coughs> outing and its consequences and its <coughs> scope with, uh, with WikiLeaks? <laughs> well, <coughs> in that in that case, I mean, the it's a, it's a violation of statutory law. There's actually a law on the books that, that makes, makes it a that crime, crime to reveal the identity of CIA <coughs> operatives, and and it was the punishing the leaker was being punished <coughs> in that case, and the reporter you, Judith Miller. She simply goes to jail for 85 days because she refuses to reveal her source, not because she <coughs> revealed Valerie Plame's identity. So it wasn't a, a prosecution of that. And, that, and that's where the soldier is, you know, facing. Yeah, and the soldier's and just toast. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, you know, he's just like, it's too bad for him because you know, he's in a world of trouble and he doesn't have any First Amendment right to steal this this information from the government and give it to WikiLeaks. So I hope he you know, thinks he did a noble thing. He's going to be go gone for a long time. Yeah. You know, historically, the military, and I'll uh, speak about the military aspect of it, uh, and the media have cooperated in the, the keeping the secrets, some secrets. The New York Times story organizations, like the New York Times and the Washington Post, have secrets that the military knows that they have. And for a certain reason, they keep those. I, I think the refusal of, of 
the U.S. government to redact the documents are based on a couple of things. One is they don't want to give that level of an organization week to weeks the status of the New York Times and the Washington Post. Uh, the other is the volume of the documents. Because it's no longer documents, it's data. And it's that large. It, it requires a lot of effort to redact that. Football records here on campus, I mean, that's taken us almost a year to go through those emails just here on campus. You can imagine what, what trying to redact something like this would do to the U.S. government, not just to move to the U.S. government. So to, 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 to agree to that is a, is a resource commitment they don't want to go through. Right. And it's a yeah. policy step. And I think it was a, on WikiLeaks part, it was sort of a, like a false invitation. It's kind of like, oh, you want to help us at work? We'd be fine with that knowing that they were never going to do that. That's right. <laughs> You know, military. Uh, we need to let, um, we're going to come back to your question, if that's okay, because we need to let um, Lois go here, and then we'll come back to more questions, because she'll be mad at me. So, Kathy stood up, so now I have to stand up. <laughs> uh, I was going to try to avoid having to stand. Thanks a lot. I'll be quiet, too. All right. And I can't bang on the table, I'm told, so I'll be careful with that. Um, so, <coughs> Kathy has gone with a lot of the area of what we uh, can do. Uh, and cannot do, and part of what um, the ethical application of this is, well, what should we do? Because we obviously have access to this information. Uh, as, and I'm looking at this predominantly from the media perspective, what are our ethical responsibilities then now that we have this uh, access to this type of information? Uh, a couple of things that I think contextually uh, play into the decision from an ethics perspective. Um, I was talking yesterday to my colleague, Napoleon Byers, who was just talking about the military aspect of it. Uh, and, and some of the elements of what category of secret are we talking about here uh, as being one of the issues. And if I understand it correctly, it is not the most austere violation. We're talking secret stuff that, uh, and secret stuff has been, as, as Kathy noted, has been published in various and sundry places um, uh, for, for decades. So I think ever since the possibility of uh, giving away secrets, somebody gave them away. So, uh, but there's also the aspect of context to work into this as well. So if I have documents A, B, C, and D, if I know how those go together, then I may have a little bit more information. But because the volume that's there, some of it is the likelihood that anybody's going to put A, B, C, and D together to get anything further is, is still very unlikely. There's also the question, and, and Kathy alluded to this as well, is um, does uh, the government tend to overclassify information? Um, uh, many people um, will argue yes. That there's, it's, uh, it's easier to overclassify than underclassify. So, uh, so consequently, sometimes information gets revealed, and the government will say, "Oh well, yeah, that's not really that big of a deal because it wasn't quite as secret as we made it out to be." It erodes trust, which becomes something of the ethical issue for us as people who are consuming this information. And this is why you you tend to end up with uh, Julian Assange and others who are questioning the uh, credibility of the bodies who are providing information. So these are some of the challenges, I think, uh, that we face from the ethics perspective. I think timing has also been an issue here. Uh, had this been something that was closer to uh, 2001, 9-11, the reaction probably would have been very different, but we're 10 years out now. And as a country, our emotional <coughs> level has settled a bit. We, we still, these types of things, create blips, we get uncomfortable. Uh, but it's not quite the discomfort that probably would have happened had something like this occurred in uh, 2001, 2002. I think that probably would have um, uh, created a lot more of that concern that perhaps we had during World War I. There was a lot more of this tension that would have been there and, and maybe different uh, actions would have occurred uh, from a, a legal perspective. The other aspect I think is important with regard to the secrecy piece or the type of information is some of this information was just uh, embarrassing to have been shared. It was schoolyard uh, insults. I don't like somebody's <coughs> hair, somebody doesn't wash well, 
whatever it is, you know, I don't like the diplomat I have to work with. And, uh, you know, it, it's not compromising, it's embarrassing. And some of it has been, uh, somebody, uh, one of my colleagues uh, was talking about, he saw something that it shouldn't be just wikileaks.com, but wikileaks.tmz.com. <laughs> because there's so much of it, this gossipy type of stuff that's going out there that really isn't anything but we get red in the face for it. And Hillary Clinton, for example, has had to spend a bit of time with mea culpas, with some of her <coughs> counterparts saying, you know, we, sorry you got access to our schoolyard banter, basically. And one of the people at least responded, don't worry about it, you should hear what we say about you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, it, this is not an uncommon thing. Uh, so I think some of the, the ethical area for me um, uh, comes down to pieces of um, what is the responsibility uh, as a watchdog. Uh, and, and we have aspects from this country with the First Amendment, uh, these uh, a lot broader freedoms uh, than some of the other countries who are being affected by WikiLeaks. But uh, in the United States, our freedoms are rather broad. It does create an interesting power dynamic. Uh, that uh, sort of the Uncle Ben from Spider-Man with great power comes great responsibility. What do you do with the information when you get it? And then balancing how much of this really is national security and, and weighing in on this. And I think uh, some of the things that mainstream media have done really falls more in this middle ground uh, ethical area of, okay, let's check what we have and asking either government counterparts uh, parts or experts elsewhere if they saw something they were concerned might be a sensitivity, like revealing names of people, like not getting into the Valerie Plame sort of a situation. They asked questions before they went public with that type of information so that it, it, they were going to make sure that it was something that would be viable. The other aspect was just to determine is this newsworthy? Is name calling or you know just uh, everyday activities uh, among your your average run of the mill diplomatic community something that we really need to know? Uh, so these are I think some of the challenges uh, that we face. The other document to look at from an ethics perspective may be something like the Code of Ethics for um, uh, journalists. This is a society of professional uh, journalists has four basic categories. The primary one I think in play here or the, the balancing act is between seek truth and report it and minimizing harm. But there is this aspect of being honest, fair, and courageous. And usually I don't think of journalists in the United States having to worry too much about courage because there are such broad freedoms. There are some countries where courage really comes into play. But in this, uh, this instance here where there's, there is some conflict, there's the aspect of at least not just saying, oh, well, because the government says it's, it's uh, national security, we're not going to touch it. I think mostly from a media perspective, if they say this is national security, they glom to it like just as quick as you possibly can because that's a red flag. But also minimizing harm, understanding uh, that people, their human beings are, are involved here as well. And how do we go about that particular aspect of, of balancing these, these rights that we have and making sure that we're not going to put somebody in harm's way? Being <coughs> independent, again, would function here uh, with regard to the government doesn't tell media what to do. They may try, uh, but uh, it rarely works. There may be instances, uh, such as Napoleon mentioned, where you have access to information as a reporter and you have unwritten agreements as to this is something that uh, you have access to but really is not for public consumption. And part of media credibility is honoring that particular promise. But that's not always uh, on the aspect. And then, then being accountable to, uh, you know, whatever you do, taking responsibility for it. Now, the other uh, ethical question that's going to come up is, well, does uh, Julian Assange even fall under this aspect? And, and probably not. First of all, 
codes, professional codes of ethics only apply to those people who are members of those organizations. So it's not um, really anything that um, uh, media can do. But there's also aspects of, of what, uh, what is Julian Assange's role. Is he a journalist in the traditional sense? We have much more of the citizen journalist uh, element going on. And some of the challenges that occur with regard to, well, you know, if we have to follow these standards as traditional journalists, um, what does it mean for everybody else? Um, I think for the most part, um, it, as far as my, my particular viewpoint on it uh, is, uh, from an ethics perspective, most of the media, I think, are okay. Uh, I think what uh, an organization like the New York Times has done to, to screen what they have access to, to take some responsibility, to look at, well, what is it that we have, is uh, a viable way to go. It doesn't mean uh, it is essential that everything be protected. But there is a responsibility to know what is it that we have and what is it that we are providing and, and moving forward with that. So I'll just tempt you with that and go open for questions for both of us. Yeah, too. I was, um, I could be a speaker, I was Kathy. to something, but you, you mentioned the New York Times a couple of times, so, um, and she mentioned the military and the consequences for this military guy who released right. things. Mm -hmm. right. And I have a combination question. Last week I read in the New York Times and it blew me away. And they didn't, they didn't report where their source came from. Mm -hmm. But it was about Jonathan Pollard, who was um, accused of spying for a friendly uh, nation, Israel and um, has been given a life sentence where people that usually do that to a hostile nation get only four years. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they've gotten five, mm -hmm. but to a, it's never happened with a friendly person. And the, the report in the New York Times said that um, for every president since this happened, there have been numerous uh, senators and governors who have pleaded for his release. And every Israeli government has quietly um, gone to the president, which a Democrat or Republican, to plead Pollard's case. And it was the military, this is what it was, this was the thing that was so mind boggling. <coughs> At the 11th hour, several of the presidents were going to pardon him. But the military intervened and said, this is the most heinous crime we've ever seen and you must keep him in jail. And so to not upset the military, Jonathan <coughs> Pollard has, has been um, deteriorating, even though in jail, even though he had no prior arrests and that he would agree to move to Israel and not even be in the US anymore if they released him. So I was just shocked that this was not, it was like the back page of the New York Times. Why wasn't this huge that the military had this kind of influence and uh, above the president? And, you know, why did we not find out about it till now? And why didn't the New York Times release their source or say what organization it came from? So I had all those questions have been bubbling in me for the last week. Well, the military doesn't have power over the president. But they did. Because That's the president is the, well, no, they only if him. he agrees to it, because he's the commander in chief. Each president so, has felt threatened by yeah. the military and the power of the military. He knows the. He yeah, I don't, I don't really believe that. I don't know, I mean, Napoleon here is a military guy shaking his head. Um, you know, I don't think so. But, I mean, there are probably all the kind of political reasons that the, that the president goes along with this, but I. Right, but that's the point, that, yeah. that he has quietly, even though he was going in the direction and told people he was going to release pardon power, each president, um, he back, each one, each one backed, backed down. out the yeah. last minute because yeah. of the... Well, the military might have convinced him, might have convinced the president mm -hmm. that they needed to, to keep this guy in jail. But they don't have the power to make that decision for him. 
I know that, but the, they, I think they threatened him, you know, with their support or for something. We <coughs> don't know exactly what they said to him, but it was enough to have each president change his mind. He had already from, told inner circle people they was going to pardon the college. From, from a source perspective, it, it may vary. A lot of um, uh, the anonymity of sources is, is taken very seriously by most media of, of being cautious uh, as to when they will grant anonymity. And um, uh, particularly with the more established media are, are very careful. Although I, I would have to say the trend in the last 10 to 15 years has been a lot more anonymous sources are providing information about certain certain things going on. But there are standards uh, to play as to when uh, it, would you go for anonymity? Is there, uh, is the person who's providing the information, uh, is there some sort of risk there? Are they able to confirm the information uh, um, somewhere else as well so that he's more of a, a background source and they are uh, able to uh, at least confirm some of the information. No, I don't um, I actually have enough confidence in the New York Times. They would not have printed it if mm -hmm. they hadn't checked and double-checked yeah. that this yeah. was accurate right. information. Right, right. I just found it curious that yeah. they didn't mention anywhere it came from. Right. And it was such shocking information. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to mm -hmm. be on the current page. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's no telling. Um, along the same lines, talking about anonymity, a lot of the criticism of the WikiLeaks case is that um, mm -hmm. There are sources in Afghanistan whose identity um, have now been revealed who have been working with the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And the concern is that those people are now in danger. Um, so I'm curious, you know, thinking about the journalism code of ethics, mm -hmm. uh, where, where does that, obviously minimizing harm right. is right. a huge part right. of that, but also right. what about potential chilling effects of, you know, future sources in mm -hmm. Afghanistan who now right. don't mm -hmm. think it's safe to yeah, and that, that is a consequence that I think uh, when you're weighing what are your consequences of particular actions uh, that they would have to take into consideration is, you know, have we in somehow uh, uh, by taking this bold step, have we compromised something else as a result and then weighing those two? I think it's, uh, I think it's a valid point to raise, yeah. Now, now, legally, I would say that some possible harm sometime in the future doesn't justify censorship. Right, that's what I'm thinking about. You know, that's, about. so that's just sort of a different thing. Yeah. Right. You know, because it's more of a, there, you know. there in terms of journalism and law? Yeah. You know, are there any cases where it's well, in the Pentagon Papers case, when the government argued that this was going to make it difficult to have diplomatic, good diplomatic relations with other countries because the other countries wouldn't believe that we could keep secrets. Mm -hmm. And that's a big the concern. Same kind of thing. Same thing. The court was just, it was like, well, maybe, maybe not. That's right. your problem. Right. But I think when you think about minimized harm, you have to realize that the uh, media is not an arm uh, of the U.S. government. Right. And so it's, it's, the minimized harm would be to the um, to your sources and to your readers, but harm to the government, I think, is not part of the calculation. Um, though maybe the New York Times, maybe some big media organizations disagree with me, but I don't think it should be. Well, um, it would be harm to harm soldiers, for example. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, right. there, there are But that's the, way the it policies is. of the U.S. government or some abstract Your job is hard entity, right? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, in the back. Oh. Yes, sir. Um, I was interested in this code of ethics. There's nothing yes. in there to distinguish between providing titillating information, providing right. genuinely substantive information. Right. Isn't, isn't that an important ethical issue? I mean, oh, sure. a lot of us yeah. worry about yeah. it. Yeah, what is news becomes, uh, it's, a, it's a harder and harder definition now. Are we into... Um, you know, entertainment more than in the titillation aspect of it, which I think some of it has been screened out. You know, that's that whole TMZ reference was, geez, there's an awful lot of this stuff that isn't even newsworthy, you know, that, that's out there. But no, the code doesn't really get into making that distinction. It, it, there's sort of an assumption that everybody knows what it makes something newsworthy. Uh, so they're, they're not defining news as part of this. What they're saying is when you report news, be accurate, be, be fair, and do you think that's right? I mean, do you think it is sort of so obvious we don't need any 
Um, it, I think it changes over time. I think it's something that we uh, in the journalism school here and, and elsewhere spend a lot of time talking about making those distinctions because, no, I don't know that it's, it's uh, as clear a distinction as it should be. I think it's clearer for the journalist. I think it's less clear for the consumer. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, Go there. The big issue now is to when, say, census disclosures identify are jointly to find to identify individuals in violation of privacy. Right. Not to mention the the, the, faith, the TMZ type of yeah. what should be our standards of private expectations of privacy. So what do you, what do you think of what this expectation should be? Well that the second question, the first question of the disclosure of yeah, I, I look at it in, and those are, my students are all going to roll their eyes, but I, I, I look at it in sort of three categories of what is it that we have a right to know, which is legal, what is it that we need to know to function daily, and what falls under the category of we just want to know. And a lot of this stuff that is borderline newsworthy is more in a want to know category, and really I think is uh, behooves the journalist to make a decision uh, you know, is there, what are the redeeming qualities of this that, that make it worthwhile reporting other than we get a lot of readers or viewers? Yeah. I think that's a really good bridge to my question. I want to oh, cool. ask you to comment on the utility of these documents. Most of the comments I've heard have concerned the size of the dump and how many documents are available. And I only have one piece of anecdotal evidence to support this, but I was listening to a podcast from The Economist about what just happened in Indonesia and they interviewed a professor at New Michigan saying, well, from the diplomatic cables released by WikiLeaks, we know that this has been happening in Tunisia, and this has been happening. And it, my sense from just hearing that one reference and getting that one additional insight on something that happened in the world makes me think this, these diplomatic cables are really valuable mm -hmm. for people that want to better understand international incidents. Um, I think if you were studying American diplomacy, yeah. you would be if you were looking for a dissertation topic, you'd be so happy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you'd be just jumping up and down. Yeah. You'd be like, I got it. You know, like, it'll be publishable as a book. <laughs> Three volume set. <laughs> yeah, it is. I, I think that's a big issue. Um, you know, I think we can't overlook it. Any time uh, citizens can understand how their government works, whether it's like watching sausage be made or whether it's you know whether it's perfect democracy. Um, that's valuable. Yeah. And I think to a certain degree, although you know you can argue did they go to extreme, but part of their the mission with regard to WikiLeaks was to um, you know keep know what's going on, know what's going on in your country, uh, know what's going on in your government um, as as a viable uh, thing to do. Did they go about it the right way? That's the question mark. But I think some of the intent certainly was we got to know what's going on here, and yeah. we don't. And I think one of the smokescreen issues here is whether um, Assange is actually a journalist. Yeah. Um, that's just you know that's just to say okay if he's really a journalist then maybe it's okay but if he's not he's just a troublemaker. Mm -hmm. You know the best journalists are troublemakers. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we've really I think dealt with well in the journalism school is that all people like, all these people like him and bloggers and people who are going to tweet and all that they're all journalists now. And if you come take journalism classes they're teaching you how to tweet. <coughs> So, you know, we don't draw those kind of distinctions like you have some rights because you are with the New York Times, but you run WikiLeaks, so you're not. And in terms of the First Amendment, it doesn't matter because the court's very clear that every citizen has the same rights of freedom of the press. It doesn't matter if you work for the New York Times or you are um, going to write something and put it on your bulletin board. You know, you have the same rights. So that's just a way to kind of discredit or marginalize Assange, I think. As an aside, this this, I think the U.S. government has been really restrained in this the offensive capability of, uh, of, of their cyber warfare could have shut down WikiLeaks or anything else. I, I think it just really has been a, an intelligence demand. Because with electronic footprints, you can see a spider web of activity in this activity, this information has from place to place. So there, there are two parts of this that, that I think it makes it a dress rehearsal for something much more serious in the future. The one is, it's, it's given us, or the intelligence community, a look at how information is passed in places where we didn't know about before, just by checking computers and how to communicate. So that's, that's one reason I think they were reserved 
And <coughs> the other reason is, I think they want to know, okay, what do we do when it really counts? Mm -hmm. And they, they've established protocols for that. There's a cyber security officer in the uh, that communicates with intelligence agencies. And, and I think that <coughs> when it really does count, like nuclear large codes or census data, you know, or medical data that we can't compromise, you'll see a different reaction from the U.S. government. I hope not. Now I think what we've seen a lot of just sort of mm -hmm. Biden calling them a high-tech terrorist and pounding his yeah. chest. It's like, you know, a little trying to demonize him and deflect some of the blame away from the government onto, onto WikiLeaks. But um, it's interesting that you think that they really wanted to shut it down. They would have just like oh, yes. hit the button and it would have like cyber exploded. <laughs> clearly, I mean, they've clearly have been able to affect Iran's nuclear capabilities with technology and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we haven't really talked about this from the parallel story where the government can effectively shut Julian Assange down through, you know, overreaching prosecution and then the media plays into it and responds to it and, you know, incredible coverage of the sex charges or sex allegations, whatever they were. I'm still not exactly clear, oh, yeah. you know, whether it's actually his heart. But anyway, yeah. um, that the press just sort of fell right in the line with it. And well. kept repeating over and over again that he had been charged with a sexual crime, and in fact it was still in the allegation stage. And, and so, you know, what are the responsibilities of all the parties there? And did the government, in fact, you know, overreach in that way? Yeah, they didn't. They didn't press the button the way they would in, you know, the Soviet Union and shut everything down. But they figured out a way to show. They were button him pushing. The most terrible yeah. man, <laughs> yeah. terrible man yeah. in the world for a couple Right. Of right. Years, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that you know, the media play into that because the media, the traditional media, are threatened by new technologies. Mm -hmm. And so they're pretty happy to jump on the bandwagon and say, this guy's not really a journalist. So they're pretty willing to do that. You see a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, part of the story is because it involves the Internet. Any crime that gets media attention gets this much attention, unless it involves the Internet, and then it gets this much attention, just because we're all still kind of buzzed about the Internet. And we also see, my graduate students are here, that through history that the mainstream media have been very poor defenders of the First Amendment rights of other media outlets. <laughs> um, their record is horrible. You know, when it's them and it's the Pentagon Papers, they're like, oh, this would be the end of democracy as we know it. And when it's WikiLeaks, it's like, oh, who are they? Until they get the documents, then the New York Times, then they're, then they're happy. The New York Times didn't have the documents, they'd be willing to sell them down the river. That's not right, either. <laughs> one, of, you know, one of the most interesting aspects of this to me is how the internet will change based on this. So you know, right now, it's such a nebulous thing. They're each, you know, it's so international without any international cooperation. Do you have any idea or foresee any specific changes occurring within governments or within kind of how the internet is regulated and managed? Or is it just too? Impos it's impossible to know what will happen. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I haven't thought about it, so I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure there are people who want to regulate it more, and it'd be interesting to see what the U.S. government does to try to rem keep this from happening. Again. It, because it's an issue where multiple governments are being affected yeah. in the exact same way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So whether they get together yeah. and try to do something, they might. The Library of Congress actually said that you know, as a government agency, that nobody within their auspices was allowed to access information provided by WikiLeaks. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and they encourage right. anyone looking for a job in government not to do, not to to do, do so. Right. right. Yeah. And that includes the Congressional Research Service, which is the branch of the library that does research for Congress people. <laughs> so these people are not allowed Boy, to access information that is available too. to the public at large. I mean, I think that's an area that the government yeah. really needs to uh, come into the yeah. present day with. Like, yeah. You can't put that information back away after it's been No, it's out. And yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah. He was just telling me that yeah. before. He's interested in working for the FBI. So he's being told, it's if you ever want to work for the FBI, do not. Because don't, don't 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 the information is or out there, but it's still classified. Right. Right. So, you're, or the yeah. so you're still considered disseminating classified information? Yeah. You had, you had a, a question. Yeah, to what extent we're starting to see other companies, I know Visa and MasterCard both mm -hmm. denied. Um, payments to WikiLeaks, and also I believe the government was instigated to Twitter so that they would sort of monitor all the WikiLeaks talks going on. To what extent are those against actions? Or like, well, how, 
Yeah. Yeah. They, they can do that because the First Amendment only prohibits the government from punishing WikiLeaks. But so but MasterCard doesn't want to do business with WikiLeaks anymore. It doesn't have to. You know, obviously the. Uh, that the credit card people must feel that they're either, and I think the government asked them to do that, and they either felt pressure from the government or they thought that the public didn't support WikiLeaks and they didn't want to be part of it. They may have decided that as a public relations issue, it was good not to be involved, but what do you think? That, that could be part of it too. I think probably pressure was playing a role in it, public pressure, yeah. probably more than anything else.